Today's topic is, of course, teaching the civil rights movement with primary source documents. You might remember that last week uh, we talked about framing the civil rights movement. We tried to establish a sort of old civil rights history versus new civil rights history. And I'm not saying necessarily one was right or wrong, but rather that the two could, could be in conversation with each other. Uh, and what we're going to do today is focus in particular on a two year period in what you might call the classical phase of the civil rights movement, you know, within that old civil rights history, the years 1963 and 1964. And of course, in many ways, that fits into the old civil rights framework. You know, it, uh, these are, this is a time of nonviolent protests, a time where Martin Luther King is a central character, uh, at a time when there's a winning over to some degree of public opinion on the issue of racial justice. Uh, and there is, of course, the transformative legislation passed, the first of the two major pieces of civil rights legislation, the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Uh, but I also hope that we can approach those the same time frame from this framework of the new civil rights history that we tried to understand uh, more in our last session. Uh, we'll look at the intersection of local and national movements, particularly in the, in the case of Birmingham. We'll focus to some degree on the role of women in the movement by looking a little bit more at Fannie Lou Hamer. Uh, we'll see the black freedom struggle in the North, particularly through the lens of Malcolm X, uh, and also with that sort of more international consciousness. Uh, and together, I hope that, you know, all the documents that we're going to look at today are going to help to, or many of the documents are going to help to disrupt in many ways, a sort of easy history of the civil rights movement, uh, the, of one of just progress and triumph. Um, focus in particular on, on the three characters of Martin Luther King, Malcolm X, and Fannie Lou Hamer. And of course, when you focus on individuals, there's some uh, danger to that, right, in the sense of are we creating a great man, or, or in this case, a great woman history as well. But it's also critical to recognize that history is about people, and that's often what our students relate to. And, and, and I think it's just a fundamental human impulse to relate to human beings and their stories. Um, and I think each of these three characters can get us thinking about the larger issue of the role of the civil rights movement in shaping ideas about American democracy. Uh, how do each of these three figures consider democracy? What avenues exist for Black people to achieve their rights as citizens? These are some of the questions we're asking. Of course, we're telling this story in particular through primary sources. Uh, and as you all know, right, primary sources are the, the raw material which make history so compelling. They get us to make history into, a, into an active endeavor rather than a passive endeavor. Uh, when students who don't like history tend to think of it as just a recitation of names and dates and facts, right? But uh, those of us who do like history love the active interpretation and thinking that goes into it. And of course, it fosters the kind of critical thinking skills that we want our students to be absorbing. With each of these sources, as historians do, we'll try to place them into historical context. We'll try to understand you know, the author, their audience, because that shapes the presentation of, of the source, uh, its purpose, uh, and its strategies in particular we'll be looking at. And we'll try to, of course, place that into a larger historical meaning. Um, one thing that really struck me in last week's chat, you guys were having such a great discussion in the chat last week. Uh, you, were, you were adding on uh, you know, viewpoints and sources and ideas and classroom strategies. And one thing that really struck me that someone wrote was, you know, using primary sources in particular in this subject is a great way to uh, sort of bypass a lot of these restrictions that you're now facing as teachers in Texas regarding the CRT, anti-CRT legislation, right? You're, you're letting the, the facts speak for themselves, the sources speak for themselves. Uh, if you're directly analyzing figures from history via the evidence, maybe it makes it a little bit more... Um, maybe you have an avenue in, uh, in a way that, that might be difficult otherwise. And of course, I know that you're facing exceptionally unique and difficult situations uh, in the classroom in that sense. And I, I can't speak entirely to that, but I hope that the primary sources help us as a way through that. So let's begin then in Birmingham, Alabama in 1963. Uh, some people called it at the time, Bombingham. Uh, there had been 18 racially motivated bomb, uh, bombings, 50 cross burnings, uh, between 1957 and 1963 in the city of Birmingham. It had the reputation of, as perhaps the most segregated city in America, you know, segregated in terms of its public facilities, uh, very few Blacks with access to the vote, uh, you know, roughly one eighth of the population, and it was a city in particular notorious for white violence, in particular through its police commissioner, Bill Connor. And so the first of the sources uh, that, we, that we have to think about um, Birmingham in this, in this context is the Birmingham Manifesto. This is a document drafted in particular by Fred Shuttlesworth. Uh, and Shuttlesworth is a giant in the local Birmingham movement. And it gives us a great intersection in ways of thinking about that theme of the local movements and the national movements, right? Uh, Shuttlesworth is a close associate of Martin Luther King. Uh, he's part of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, King's organization, but he is also sort of uh, at the center of, a, of, a, of local concerns. And, he, and he's the person who black people in Birmingham gravitate toward in terms of the civil rights movement. 
Um, and this document is drafted very much at the very beginning of the Birmingham movement that begins in the spring of 1963. Um, as you can see from, from reading the document, that it's really sort of insistent upon inserting African Americans into the democratic tradition, right? Uh, Birmingham is part of the United States and quote, we are bona fide citizens. Uh, we believe in the American dream of democracy, the Jeffersonian doctrine that all men are created equal, right? Uh, and, if you're, and this document really portrays African Americans as worthy, even exceptional participants in uh, American democracy. It documents their highlight, or highlights their patient enduring of setbacks, of delays, the way they've been subject to extraordinary violence. Uh, we appeal to the citizenry of Birmingham, uh, to the citizenry of Birmingham, Negro and white, to join us in this witness for decency, morality, self-respect, and human dignity. It's appealing to man's better nature. So you can understand why this document might be used as a way to sort of set forth uh, the goals for this Birmingham movement uh, for, for the, that's, that's going to begin in the spring of 1963. It builds upon the past. It paints African Americans as worthy participants in democracy. There's a certain optimism, perhaps, attached to it, a certain faith in the American dream uh, of democracy, even as it is highlighting the ways that African Americans have been excluded from that democratic tradition. As for King, right? King is the uh, is and, and his Southern Christian Leadership Conference uh, uh, are at the heart of what comes known as Project C. Uh, C standing for comp for confrontation. These demonstrations on downtown Birmingham that begin in April of 1963. King, along with Shuttleworths, uh, selects three specific uh, targets for the demonstrations when they begin. They, they focus on downtown department stores, uh, including an economic boycott and these mass marches. Uh, and they're teaching large numbers of residents about the tactics of nonviolent direct action. And they wait, it's important to note, until after the, or a mayoral election. Uh, there is a more moderate candidate, a guy named Beltwell. And they wait until after this, uh, after that mayoral election, uh, where Bull Connor narrowly loses, simply to uh, to emphasize the point that they're not interfering directly into local politics, but rather focusing on the issue of racial justice. Uh, there's a state court injunction after a few days of these of these marches that say you uh, you can't have these. Uh, uh, demonstrations anymore, and King decides to defy those uh, it, that injunction. Uh, basically, he's, he'll appeal to federal law, but state law, he's arguing, is immoral. He says, here in Birmingham, we have reached the point of no return. And it's in this context that he receives a letter from eight white clergymen in Birmingham. Um, most of the Protestant tradition, one is Jewish, I believe one is Catholic as well, but I'm, I'm not certain of that. Um, and this is in the context these, these clergymen are writing to him. Uh, they are not Arch conservatives. They are not uh, sup uh, supporters of Bull Connor. Uh, they believe that they're moderates. They're liberals uh, in the Southern context. They believe that that Birmingham is making steady progress, um, and so they urge patience. They're against these demonstrations. They think the demonstrations are what's causing the trouble in uh, the city. This is the letter that they. You know, here's some, here are some quotes from the letters that they write. They say, "We're now confronted by a series of demonstrations by some of our." Negro citizens directed and led in part by outsiders. You know, I've, I've bolded all the, the points that are bolded. They're not in the documents themselves, of course. Uh, but, I, but I've tried to highlight things that I think is, are really important, right? And then they, they criticize them as unwise and untimely. Uh, they suggest that, again, that sort of they're really sort of speaking of King here and of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. Uh, so there's some implications here of sort of, you know, you're, you're interfering in our local race relations. This isn't, this isn't right for us. Um, and if you look at, at the other selection that we have here at the end, it says we appeal to both our white and Negro citizens or citizenry to observe the principles of law and order and common sense. Uh, one of the criticisms that, that King often has of white moderates is that they're more interested in, in, uh, in order than in justice. Um, and this is and this speaks directly to that point, right? Here, here they are choosing order over what he sees as justice. So this is really important for your students to perhaps think about, right? These clergymen are not the they don't see themselves as the enemies of the civil rights movement. They see themselves as moderates. They see themselves as on the side of racial progress. They can they have good intentions, in other words. But you can have good intentions and fail to see other perspectives, right? Uh, and thus misunderstand the issue that King is trying to bring forth. And, and so it can perhaps help to illuminate our, our students our students' worldview to help you know help them question themselves. Are they understanding people from different perspectives, and are they making informed judgments based on those perspectives? Doesn't mean they have to accept every perspective, but it means they need to think about them. And of course, it's this letter that King responds to in letter from Birmingham jail. Uh, 
just to sort of place King into context. Remember, uh, we, we know the background of King. We know him as the as a coming out of the black elite in Atlanta. We know, of course, that he has his PhD from, uh, from Boston University and his rise through the Montgomery bus boycott of the 50s. Uh, and is sent into sort of um, the, the key spokesman of the civil rights movement, as we discussed last week. Here, let's go a little bit more into depth into sort of his ideology, his worldview. King comes out of a religious tradition, uh, and he's particularly um, uh, driven by the ideas of Reinhold Niebuhr, a the theologian of the early 20th century, who was very important to a number of progressive thinkers uh, throughout the, throughout that century. That really is, its argument is that he has no faith in man's essential goodness, that the man is, is inherently sinful, in other words. Um, and, you know, this is a sort of a Niburian belief in sort of the depth of sin. Uh, and that's, it leads, you know, and it's, this is critical because, you know, for, for a traditional liberal, they think, you know, we're making this steady march toward progress. Things will continue to get better. For King, you know, he doesn't see that. He says, you know, the only way that things get better is to compel that to happen. So there's this pessimism about sort of human nature. But there's also this sincere, deep rooted belief in the worth of humanity, that every human being has an intrinsic worth, that all of humanity is interrelated. And it, as he draws for this is sources from the Bible and also from traditions of American democracy. Uh, King's idea of a beloved community uh, uh, that brings people together is rooted in both the American tradition and in the Christian tradition. In fact, his oratory consistently brings them together, fuses them into one. So this theology shapes his outlook. He believes that you have to compel change. The idea of the social gospel, the idea that uh, of segregation is what, what he calls rational, rationally inexplicable and morally unjustifiable, right? The, 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 the Christian teachings can help bring about social change. In particular through his, has this faith in the power of nonviolence, right? Nonviolence works as he sees it because it teaches the participant in it about their own worth, about their own self-respect, and the only that by elevating themselves kind of above on the higher moral plane, can they teach their oppressor? That's the, that's the core idea behind it. So when King writes the letter from a Birmingham jail, the famous document that many of us teach in our classes that we know, of course, as this sort of um, almost perfect summation of King's ideology uh, and, and, and exceptionally eloquent. We know that it's penned on these scraps of paper while he's in jail for defying that court injunction in April of 1963. And we know that this letter gets circulated in pamphlets and journals and, and sort of grows in stature over time. Uh, but it's very much in response to that, to this, the, 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 the letter from the liberal white clergyman, right? He responds to the criticism that he's an outside agitator. He says, no, I was invited. I'm part of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, but in the larger sense, wherever there's injustice, you know, man is beholden to confront that injustice. Uh, I live in the United States, so I can't be an outsider. I'm an American citizen, and so too are the Negro citizens of Birmingham. He also responds to the criticism that it's untimely. Uh, he describes that this isn't untimely at all. This is very deliberate. He describes the process of nonviolent direct action, the, the four deliberate steps along the way. Uh, and his argument is, look, nonviolent direct action doesn't cause trouble. It simply brings the society's tensions to the surface. It creates the crisis that brings those tensions to the surface. And by doing so, it brings power to the powerless. When the clergymen say, you know, be patient, wait, that's per perhaps brings in the most emotional and most powerful aspect of letter from a Birmingham jail. This idea of waiting is something that, that he cannot um, stomach, right? And perhaps the you know the, the passage on the on the right here, right when he this this long sentence when he talks about sort of all the emotional wounds of segregation, including talking about his own family and about his his kids and saying well, they want to go to Funtown, the amusement park in Atlanta, but they can't because it's segregated. And at the end of this incredibly emotional passage, he says, "Then you will understand why we find it difficult to wait." Maybe the most famous passage in the letter from a Birmingham jail is this is this quote, we know from painful experience that freedom is never voluntarily given by the oppressor. It must be demanded by the oppressed. And this goes against that sort of traditional liberal formulation that, you know, over time we will, you know, through through reason and through rationality, we'll see the ways in which we are, can improve society and we'll continue to reform moderately and move toward that. King says, no, ultimately if, if oppressed people don't put their concerns forward, the rest of the, the rest of humanity won't see it. King further responds to this criticism that he's breaking the law, right? Uh, he makes a distinction between just laws and unjust laws. Uh, segregation is morally unsound, right? Uh, and thus the implication is that we'll obey federal laws, but this is why we're defying the state court injunction. 
And within this, there's also a criticism of uh, sort of the objects of King's disappointment. And the biggest one are white moderates, not, not, the, not, the, not the Ku Klux Klaners, not Bull Connor. He knows where they stand, right? Uh, but in recent years, he talks about the, the people who are more devoted to order than to justice, the quote that I gave you before, right? Because these are the people who are the ones who will ultimately delay the Black struggle for freedom. That said, he also, within, this, uh, within that same passage, welcomes white people of conscience who, are, uh, who he sees as supportive of the movement. He's trying to draw more white into advocates, activists, et cetera. Uh, he's also critical of what he refers to. Uh, he puts himself kind of in the middle, as we see from this other quote, uh, that on the one hand, there are, there are Black people who are too complacent and are willing to, to fight for change. And on the other hand, there are the, the extremists, what he sees as the Black radicals. He's alluding here to Malcolm X and the, and the Nation of Islam in a lot of ways. Uh, and, and look, he says, look, nonviolence is the way forward. It's a way to channel the emotions that are out there. It's a way to express them in a way that is safe and good for society. He's also critical of the church, uh, that the church is not leading with moral authority. It's mostly sitting on the sidelines and he wants it to move forward from there. So King places in the letter from Birmingham jail, King places himself into at, at the end into a number of intellectual traditions, into Christianity. At the end, when he's, when he's talking about it being an extremist, he says, and first I, I resisted that, but then he says, was not Jesus Christ an extremist? But then he also places himself in the tradition of democracy, he says, was not Thomas Jefferson uh, an extremist? Um, and he often, and at the end, he talks about sort of the, the ordinary black people, and he re makes reference to James Meredith, the man integrating the University of Mississippi, uh, but also people, uh, the uh, people who participated in the Montgomery bus boycott, and so on. Uh, so, in in sort of the black uh, folk tradition as well, these are all elements that are informing King's uh, analysis. The selection that I uh, th that I gave you is a shortened version of the letter from Birmingham Jail. I know many of you, it's easy to find, of course, if you just Google it, but you can find a full version too that gives a broader picture, depending on your student's level and how much time you want to spend with that document. Okay. So King emerges from jail in April of 1963 and the Birmingham campaign continues uh, and it starts to rivet the attention of the nation. Of course, this is the era when the nightly news uh, is, is really starting to, to focus on the very compelling street theater of the civil rights movement. And you have the Children's Crusade, which involves children as young as six, eight, 10 years old participating in civil rights demonstrations and getting jailed. Uh, you have the massive resistance uh, of Bull Connors, uh, um, uh, who's the commissioner of public safety, basically runs the police and the fire department. Uh, and he's in charge of sort of keeping order in Birmingham, but, but makes the situation worse with fire hoses and with, the and with police dogs. Um, and so it's sort of galvanizing the attention of the nation and ultimately compels the federal government to intervene. This is when John F. Kennedy is president uh, and it's focusing his attention more and more on civil rights. He's very reluctant to enter into the fray on civil rights until compelled by crises. Uh, and here he is. Uh, so he brings in you know, nas uh, National Guardsmen to, to, create or uh, to bring order to the streets of Birmingham. And he even gives a nationally televised speech in the aftermath of these demonstrations in which he calls civil rights, quote, a moral issue as old as the scriptures and as clear as the American Constitution. And Kennedy calls for a civil rights bill before Congress. This is the beginning of that legislative momentum. Uh, but it has to begin with the local movement in Birmingham that builds a tradition that then a King, uh, King Southern Christian Leadership Conference can layer upon that can then at least galvanize the attention of the nation enough to force the president of the United States to call for a civil rights bill and to highlight this hypocrisy in the American democratic tradition. This is in June of 63. A couple months later is the March on Washington, which is now designed especially to galvanize attention on a civil rights bill. But it's also important for your students, You know, everybody knows about the March on Washington. We think of it as this iconic moment in American history and as well we should, uh, but it also might help for our students to think about the roots of the March on Washington. Uh, a. Philip Randolph, the labor leader, uh, president of the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters, had called for a March on Washington in the context of World War II um, uh, because, of a because of the segregated uh, war industry and also the segregated military. And ultimately there was no march at that time because Roosevelt issued an executive order that desegregated some war industries. Uh, but a. Philip Randolph, Bayard Rustin, these are the original archi uh, architects of the, of the March on Washington. And they're so, they come from a socialist background. And originally this was a march for jobs, you know, about economic justice. And then the official name of the March on Washington is the March on Washington for jobs and freedom. So there is an economic agenda that's always part of the traditional civil rights movement as we can see here. 
of course, the march is, is famous for bringing 250,000 people peacefully to, to Washington in one day. It's a massive logistical and organizational challenge that's successfully done. It's, it's on national television, so, it's, so it brings uh, the civil rights movement into the living rooms of, of most uh, American citizens. Uh, and of course, King's I Have a Dream speech is the climactic speech at the end that everybody knows at least the end of, right? Um, again, the selection that, uh, that, that, that I sent to you with the link is just the end of the speech, the, the famous I Have a Dream part. Uh, but again, if you have the time and if, and if, if it's what you choose to, to expand upon, the full, uh, the full speech itself, of course, begins with this metaphor of, uh, of an uncashed check uh, with the idea that uh, Af African-Americans are uh, or in the bank for uh, American democracy, but, but it hasn't been realized yet. So again, King is continually trying to press African-Americans into the democratic tradition. And there's some threats in there as well. The, the idea is that there'll be, a, from the speech, there'll be a rude awakening if white people think we're just gonna return to business as usual after this. But he also calls upon black people not to be violent, uh, to not be bitter, to not behave, uh, and to look to man's better nature to the extent that they can. And it's then that he goes into the famous dream passage at the end that is so emotional and powerful. We, and we tend to think of the I have a dream speech as hopeful and resonant. And there's lots of work, notes that it hits that, that do do that. But also think about this, right? Is, is it entirely hopeful? He says, this is our hope. With this faith, we will be able to hew out the, of the mountain of despair, a stone of hope, right? The larger situation is the mountain of despair. With this faith, we'll be able to transform the jangling discords of our nation into a beautiful symphony of brotherhood. Is he painting the, the United States as a harmonious democracy? Far from it. That's his dream. That's his hope. With this faith, we'll be able to work together, to pray together, to struggle together, to go to jail together, to stand up for freedom together, knowing we'll be free one day. King never wavers from his core ideology of nonviolence, of racial brotherhood, but he's also a, you know, and, and as, as, as he implies sort of a, a belief that the African Americans have a place in American democracy, there's this constant a sense of despair and frustration that's, that lies underneath that as well. And I think that's these are important notes to hit with your students as well, to keep King from just becoming the sort of oversimplified figure. In the words of one of my colleagues, uh, you know, we, want, we don't want to think of Martin Luther King as just as, as some jolly black Santa Claus. That's not who he was and, 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 not, and not what he stood for. Okay. Shifting into 1964 continuing this discussion of American democracy and race. Right? 64 is the summer of so-called Freedom Summer. Uh, this is when a huge interracial army of activists uh, come into Mississippi, uh, the state with the lowest rates of, voter of black voter registration. Um, SNCC, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, uh, which we discussed a little bit in our last uh, session last week, is sort of at the militant vanguard of the movement. They just formed in the aftermath of the student sit-ins in 1960 and really have a faith, and if you remember our discussion of Ella Baker, uh, really have a, a, a commitment to grassroots organizing, to not just sort of media-friendly de demonstrations, but rather to empower people at the grassroots, to get people registered to vote, to have Black elected officials, for, for the Black people in communities themselves to become the leaders of those communities. Um, and so voter registration is kind of you know, at the heart of this. Um, in 1964, there's only 5% of the African-American population is registered to vote, even though they're 42% of the population. It's because there's hostility and violence that keeps them from voting. Uh, as, as one sort of piece of evidence that, that SNCC has shown that Black people want to vote, they hold a so-called freedom election in 1963, basically a mock election in which they have 80,000 unofficial votes for the governor because they can't officially vote, but showing that Black people do want to vote, do want to be part of the political process. So the Freedom Summer in 64, part of the idea is that SNCC's going to bring in all the, uh, not just its, uh, its, its uh, traditional African-American activists, but also white college students, often from elite universities, the Yales and the Harvards and the uh, Stanfords of the world, uh, with the ideas that this will focus more national attention and national protection for, uh, for voter registration, because they've been facing enormous amounts of violence and intimidation uh, as, they, as they try to register voters. Meanwhile, in preparation for this Freedom Summer, white Mississippians think it's like an invasion's coming. The mayor of Jackson, Mississippi, doubles his police force that summer, buys 250 shotguns, buys a huge armored tank to, to, uh, for the streets of Jackson. And so when the volunteers come and they spread all through Mississippi in the summer of 1964, uh, they're trying to, they're working with the local black population. You know, they're going to churches, they're going to front steps. 
uh, in many, uh, for many uh, black people in Mississippi, this is the first time they're shaking hands and making eye contact with white people. Uh, that's sort of just this sort of revolutionary moment in many ways. Um, they face extraordinary violence uh, and, and, and fear. Before they even arrive, there's the three civil rights workers who've been murdered in Mississippi, the Cheney, Goodman, and Schwerner in Philadelphia, Mississippi, in West Central Mississippi. And yet they make this political progress. They establish what are known as freedom schools uh, in which they train uh, kids in the in American politics and African American history, uh, and they establish their own Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party. The all white Democratic Party continues to refuse to let them register to vote, so they form their own branch of the Democratic Party. Uh, and the idea is that uh, they hold their own elections, they elect their own delegates, and they go to the sixty four convention, the Democratic National Convention, with the intention of being a part of the Democratic Party in that frame. Meanwhile, in the same summer is when we're seeing the debates over the civil rights bill, right? So just to give, give sort of a national um, picture here, right? John F. Kennedy is assassinated in November of 1963. Lyndon Johnson takes office and calls for this great society legislation, the idea of sort of extending the New Deal legacy, um, exploiting those democratic majorities that he has in Congress, being able to play on John, on John F. Kennedy's martyrdom, uh, it's a time of economic progress and he thinks, look, we can we can bring a new level of security and new level of democracy to more and more American citizens. Uh, war on poverty programs are part of this early initiative. And then next is really the, the big thing is the civil rights bill in 64. But it gets to the Senate after get, getting through the House easily. And in timely news, there's a filibuster. Uh, the, the, the Senate filibuster keeps the bill from progressing. You need two thirds votes for cloture, which means to uh, to end the filibuster. And so there's this massive movement among, uh, among uh, the more liberal senators, both Democrat and Republican. It's much more regional than it is party oriented at this time. Um, and they finally bring this filibuster to an end. In the midst of this, we have Senate debate. Excuse me, there's a uh, train that goes past my campus here and sometimes it disrupts class. And now it's just, now you're getting a little bit of the University of Memphis experience as students here, if, you, if you're hearing that train horn, sorry. <laughs> Okay, in terms of this debating of the civil rights bill, I tried to give us a little bit of the national political picture here, a quote, uh, quote from Hubert Humphrey and a quote from Strom Thurmond. Humphrey is the Democratic Senator from Mississippi. He's like the, he's the majority whip. He's the one who is sort of the architect of getting this, uh, the votes on the Senate for, for cloture. Uh, he wants to be vice president really badly. So he is, uh, he's trying to do this so that Johnson will make him as vice president. Uh, but he's also a wonderful speaker and kind of a giant of liberalism in, in American politics. And here he's painting it as a moderate, reasonable act, but also, quote, one of the great moral challenges of our time. Um, this, is a, this is a way to include people who've been excluded from the democratic tradition. Perhaps unsurprising in terms of the language and the, and the strategies. Strom Thurmond from South Carolina, it might interest your students to think, we think of, of course, of the, of the segregationists as against democratic rights, with, and rightfully so. But segregationists make arguments based on American rights too, on constitutional rights too. Uh, and they argue that, that it's stripping business owners, for instance, of their right to refuse service to people, uh, that it overreach of federal authority, uh, that it subscribes, that it's letting the mob, you know, civil rights activity, in other words, uh, civil rights demonstrations to dictate uh, rather than the, the laws and order of the nation, right? And there's this tension always in, in any democratic society between justice and order. We want both and we need them both. Uh, what's what's the best way forward? And here we have a conservative argument, rights-based argument that is much more interested in order. But the, but with that, of course, is without that civil rights bill, there's no justice for the African Americans who are excluded from democratic power. Of course, the civil rights bill passes ultimately uh, in June of 1964, in the midst of this Freedom Summer, and it becomes one of these key pieces of transformative legislation. Right? It brings it brings about uh, the massive desegregation. Uh, an end to legalized Jim Crow that occurs gradually over the next five to uh, seven years in, in the American South. Uh, it creates the Equal Employment Opportunities Commission. It has all sorts of far reaching effects in that sense. So back to SNCC and the MFDP and the Democratic National Convention, right? So they arrive in Atlantic City for this convention. And of course, this is Johnson's, uh, this is Lyndon Johnson's uh, shining moment, right? He's been, he was vaulted into the presidency when Kennedy was assassinated. And now he wants a harmonious convention that, that he manages. And the MFDP, he sees as potentially disrupting that. The MFDP activists come and say, look, we're, we're, we legitimately went through democratic elections. We elected these delegates. 
we deserve to be seated as official delegates from Mississippi. And they have an idealism about that. You know, Johnson's going to win in a landslide. He's running against Barry Goldwater, who's seen as a far right candidate, doesn't have the chance to win. Um, but Johnson is worried about Southern Democrats. And this is at a time when there was still a, 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 the most, uh, the, 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 the South was still dominated by the Democratic Party that will shift very soon. Um, and they're going to, they all threaten that they're going to walk out if you seat this, the MFDP instead of the all white Mississippi delegation. And so Johnson puts Hubert Humphrey, who wants that VP slot, in charge of sort of managing this compromise. And Humphrey basically offers a compromise. So the MFDP says, look, you can have two at large seats, uh, but the official delegation will be the, will be the all white one. And people like Roy Wilkins, who's the head of the NAACP, even Martin Luther King are saying, you know, you should probably take this compromise. You know, it's a, it's a step forward. And they promised that in 1968, there won't be any, uh, we'll have an integrated delegation. You know, this is gradual progress. This is liberalism at work. And the delegates say, no, the MFDP group says, no, we, Fannie Lou Hamer says, we didn't come all this way for no two seats. Now, Fannie Lou Hamer gives us another way to think about civil rights activity, right? She's a, she's someone who is a nationally known figure, the subject of biographies and so on, uh, but is also part of that grassroots movement. Um, Born as a sharecropper, lives most of her life as a sharecropper. She's kicked off her plantation after she registers to vote in the early 1960s uh, with the cooperation of some SNCC activists. She gets politicized. She's a wonderful speaker. She's a, she's a terrific gospel singer. And she's wonderful at relating to other Mississippi uh, African-Americans and getting them involved in the movement. She's jailed, as, as we know in her story, uh, for uh, uh, being politically active and gets beat. She tells that story again and again. We, one of the documents that I gave you is a, mass, is a speech that she gives at a mass meeting at the tail end of Freedom Summer in September 1964. This is to a mostly all Black audience. Uh, and it, it gives us sort of a sense of the world of Fannie Lou Hamer's worldview, right? She says, sin is beginning to reproach America today and we want what is rightfully ours. And it's no need of running and no need of saying, honey, I'm not gonna get in this mess because if you were born in America with a black face, you were born in this mess, right? So basically saying, it's urging black people to get political, to, to be involved in the movement because there's no other way out. And she tells it in very graphic terms, the story of her getting beaten in jail in, in the town of Winona, Mississippi in 1963. This is a story she tells again and again in so many speeches, sort of highlighting the violence uh, inherent in segregation. Uh, and it's told in, in much more detail than she tells it in when she, but she get, tells that very same uh, story in the speech that she gives to the credentials committee at the 1964 Democratic Convention, this, this, this famous speech that she gives, which is nationally televised. And in that speech, there's this line that I find very compelling. All of this is on account, as she's talking about the violence they face. All of this is on account we want to register to become first class citizens. And if the Freedom Democratic Party is not seated now, I question America. Is this America, the land of the free and the home of the brave, where we have to sleep with our telephones off of the hooks because our lives be threatened daily because we want to live as decent, decent human beings in America? So she's claiming American democratic rights here, right? But also questioning if that's feasible. Is this America? Should we question America, right? She's kind of teetering on the brink here. And this is a key moment in black politics because when the MFDP refuses a compromise, for many of those people who've been so active in Freedom Summer, who'd faced all that violence, who believed in the American dream of democracy, they come home from Atlantic City and they've lost that faith. They see themselves as sold out by the, by the liberals. And so they're frustrated. And that brings us to our third major figure that we're gonna to discuss today, and that's Malcolm X. Um, again, a familiar background to his story. We know, we know that he was uh, described himself as a hustler in Boston and New York. Uh, uh, jailed at age 20 for participating in a burglary in Boston, where, and that's where he receives his self-education, where he learns of the Nation of Islam, uh, where he converts, uh, where he starts his correspondence with Elijah Muhammad, and then over the course of the 1950s emerges as this major national figure. He rises along with the Nation of Islam. Its base is not in the South, but in the North, in particular in cities, uh, in particular in, in, as a function of the continuing Great Migration, and in particular in poor urban areas. Uh, and its followers are uh, subscribed to a particular personal discipline, renouncing drugs, tobacco, liquor, extramarital sex. Uh, uh, the Nation of Islam adopts aspects of Islam as practiced throughout the world, but also has a very unique cosmology or story of its religious origins. 
uh, in which whites are the artificial bleached creation of an evil geneticist uh, and black people are the chosen people. Um, and Malcolm X in particular becomes a galvanizing figure. He becomes the editor of The Messenger, which is the main publication. Uh, and then he runs Mosque Number no. 7, the one in Harlem, which is you know, in, sort of in the nation's media capital. So he's constantly featured in the media. There's a 1959 uh, TV news special by Mike Wallace, the same Mike Wallace who was, uh, was on 60 Minutes for so long, called The Hate That Hate Produced, which is about the Nation of Islam, but brings to many white Americans uh, attention to the Nation of Islam. And then he's profiled, Malcolm is profiled in major magazines through the early 1960s as the nation continues to gain adherence and as it launches this critique of the civil rights movement. We get an aspect of that critique in a speech he gives in 1963 called The Message to the Grassroots. This is to a conference of, uh, in Michigan of Black grassroots activists. Remember, this is 1963, right? This is in the heart of the civil rights uh, movement. And it's connected to what's going on in the South. But as we can see from the speech, his audience is different. Um, the issues go beyond battling legal Jim Crow. And with that, there's some questioning of the patterns of American democracy itself. He doesn't believe in, there's, Malcolm doesn't have the same faith in American democracy. America's problem, he says, is us, right? Racism is more or less a permanent state in American life, as far as Kings, as far as Malcolm sees it. And if, if racism is a permanent state, then what's the point of trying to integrate into, into, this, into this corrupt institution? Um, we have a common enemy, he says. And here he's talking sort of about white people uh, as a whole. Um, he brings in sort of an international dimension in, in parts of the speech. He talks about attending the Bandung Conference in 1954. This was a conference of sort of third world nations in, in 1954 in Indonesia. Um, so there's sort of a global idea of sort of, you know, that the that people of color around the world share common concerns in this way. He makes a distinction between what he says, black revolution and Negro revolution. Um, Negro revolution, he sees as sort of the civil rights movement as moderated, as middle-class oriented. Black revolution believes in kind of an, as he sees, he sees sort of a necessity of violence. Um, you know, the United States is a violent nation, he argues, both domestically and internationally in terms of the foreign policy. He draws direct inspiration from African independence movements, a theme that we were talking about in our last class, uh, or in our last session. Uh, he uses this metaphor of the, uh, from slavery of the, of the house Negro versus the field Negro it's as, and, and paints the, uh, the northern urban Black, the kind of person who's at uh, this conference as, you know, sort of of the Black masses, the field Negro. Uh, he subscribes to a Black nationalist vision, right? The idea of the, that the common enemy is the white man, that the aim for African Americans should not be to integrate into the larger society, but to unify and to control their own destiny, right? Uh, shaping your own destiny as a group is, is central. It questions and dismisses the idea of nonviolence. Uh, nonviolence says that you have to be on a higher moral plane just to be equal. And Malcolm says we should be, you know, self-defense is, is, the, is a true measure of equality. If someone attacks you, you have the right to attack back. The Nation of Islam preaches discipline uh, that, that, that he emphasizes. But there's also here a challenge to sort of the middle class black leadership that he sees as being part of the NAACP and King Southern Christian Leadership Conference. Malcolm's appeal, to the extent that it appeals to many black Americans, uh, is, you know, it goes beyond the South for me, right? It, it's got a national scope. It speaks to the concerns of many sort of everyday African Americans in, in Northern cities, uh, among others. Um, but it also focuses on sort of the larger dimensions of racism and, and how it's shaped the black experience. Uh, that it, he argues that it's destroyed the black self-image, and, and the way to repair that is is the unity of black people themselves. Um, and there's an emotional satisfaction in in, Mal in hearing Malcolm's fearlessness. Fearlessness. There's a famous line from Ossie, uh, Ossie Davis, the actor, gave the the uh, eulogy at Malcolm X's uh, funeral in 1965. The famous line is, "Malcolm was our manhood." Right? He's the guy who sort of stood up for us. Um, and so Malcolm X, you know, of course, comes. He has, he is right. He's appealing to a different audience. He's coming from a different background. As we think about how we critically analyze sources, this is key. Of course, Malcolm is, go, is going through sea changes at this time. Uh, there's a rift between him and Elijah Muhammad, his mentor, the the head of the Nation of Islam. By late 1963, Malcolm is saying that the nation should be more involved in sort of the reforms in American society which Elijah Muhammad rejects. There's also a personal rift as well. Mal Elijah Muhammad is jealous of Malcolm's notoriety. 
Malcolm is disillusioned by these paternity suits against Elijah Muhammad, who's supposed to be on this higher moral plane. And uh, when Malcolm X makes comments in the aftermath of John F. Kennedy's assassination, saying this is America's violent, these are the chickens coming home to roost, Elijah Muhammad uses that as an opportunity to silence Malcolm X. For three months, he's, he's supposed to stay um, basically off the media radar, radar screen. And this becomes Malcolm's launching point to leave the Nation of Islam, to form his own organization, the Organization of Afro-American Unity, or the OAAU. He travels to Mecca. He makes the Hajj to Mecca, as all Muslims are supposed to. And there he sees uh, you know, people from around the world worshiping uh, Islam, and, and that helps to shape his worldview and to sort of accept you know, sort of the, you know, a more global struggle in terms of against injustice. He never stops being a Black nationalist. And that's also evidenced by the fact that he travels to Africa as well, and he meets with African independent, uh, the leaders of the new African independent nations in Ghana, in uh, Egypt, in Ethiopia. And so black nationalism is still at the heart of Malcolm X's ideology to the end of his life. And the other document that I gave you uh, that I suggested you read from Malcolm X was this 1964 speech, The Ballot or the Bullet. And this catches him in kind of this ideological transition. He's still an unapologetic black nationalist. He's still critical of the Southern Civil Rights Movement. He's still speaking to a North, Northern audience. This isn't the same audience that Martin Luther King is speaking to either in the South or with the March on Washington. But we also see him seeking, a new, seeking new political alliances beyond religion. He's still defining himself as a Muslim, but calling for people, uh, you know, saying, I'm not a Democrat, I'm not a Republican, trying to sort of create a uh, sort of unified idea through, black, through Blackness. He emphasizes his, his Black nationalism again. Uh, and your students might be interested to think a little bit deeper about black nationalism and what it means. Is it a radical idea? Of course, that's how we tend to think of it. Is it also kind of a conservative idea uh, in the sense that, you know, it really depends on, you know, pulling yourself up from the bootstraps and creating small businesses and, and you know, sort of the, the personal discipline. These are sort of classically conservative ideas. Within the ballot of the bullet, there's a critique of the civil rights movement. He says sit-ins are passive and ineffective. The March on Washington traded on patriotism and white goodwill, which, which are ineffective tools for black people to go forward with. Revolutions, he argues, are inherently violent. Again, we see this broader inter international dimensions to his work. He talks about how the United States is guilty of human rights violations that should be brought before the United Nations. And he calls this the year of the, this is, remember, the 64, this is the election year, the year of the ballot or the bullet. And if he chooses more or less the bullet, right? But he says the Democratic Party is inherently racist. And maybe the MFDP would echo that. Black people are outside the democratic tradition. He says in the speech, I'm not an American. I'm one of the 22 million black people who are the victims of Americanism. One of the 22 million black people who are the victims of democracy. Right. So this is coming from a, a different angle on the issue of American democracy. To end, let's just say, you know, from here, the, in terms of our three main characters, right? There are areas in which they, in some ways, come together, and other ways in which they are each articulating their own particular vision of freedom, right? We know by 1965 that Malcolm X wants to be more involved in the civil rights movement. He even travels to Selma uh, in the midst of those voting rights demonstrations. But uh, of course, he never stops being a black nationalist. He never loses this, um, the sense of his idea of, of American democracy. King, as we know, evolves and, and enters into more openly radical causes by the, by the late 1960s. He's critical of the Vietnam War. He speaks more on issues of economic injustice. He, he creates the Poor People's Campaign with the idea of illuminating poverty in America, but still with this liberal hope of, uh, of fostering legislation from, from the federal government, still with a belief in nonviolence, still with a belief in the beloved community. And Fannie Lou Hamer has these very expansive notions of freedom as, as her political career continues. Uh, seeing freedom in, in uh, political terms, economic terms, very much informed by her gender as much as her race. She's part of what's called the um, uh, National Women's Political Caucus that's formed in the early 1970s as the women's rights movement is gaining momentum. Uh, and this is a grassroots organization that tries to help women uh, gain uh, political office, especially on a local scale, uh, whether, both elected and appointed um, uh, positions. And she's also part of what's called a freedom, the Freedom Farm Cooperative, which is designed to help Black agricultural workers, people on farms, to sort of create cooperatives uh, to improve their quality of life. Um, but she's also, you know, sort of scarred by her larger experiences. Uh, she dies early. She dies in 1977 when she's still in her, uh, I think she'd be in her early 50s at that point. Uh, so it's, it's not necessarily a triumphant, this isn't necessarily a triumphant story. 
each of these three figures gets more expansive in how they see African-American freedom over time, but each is also conditioned by their own particular experiences, their own particular goals, their own particular history. Uh, and so we don't, you know, sometimes we oversimplify and say, oh, everybody's fighting for the same thing. In some ways, yes. In other ways, the distinctions are important. Now, I have some more slides that are just sort of like a study questions uh, that we can think of in terms of like things that you can, uh, might, that might be good discussion topics with your students, that might be essay assignments, so anything in between, you know what, what works best in your class. But I think this is a good time to pause, uh, to get out of the, uh, to get out of this, the screen sharing and I'd love to hear any questions. That you